Schultz, and welcome to Marketing in the Digital Age. I truly believe that this is the greatest marketing course on earth, and let me tell you why. Wow, I just made you a very bold promise. The greatest marketing course on earth? Well, that promise has created an expectation in your mind. This better be good. When promise, expectation, and the customer experience all align at the same point, that's when you have a strong brand. To call this a marketing class is wrong because it's really about branding. Branding and marketing. You see, branding comes before marketing. Branding is the strategic element that decides how your product is going to be different, better, special in the marketplace. And then marketing is the execution elements that come afterwards. You see, branding is strategy. Marketing is execution. So what's the objective of branding? Well, it's very simple. It's about understanding why people buy your product or service. It's understanding how they go about making their decisions to purchase products. We humans are really very simple creatures. There's three ways that we make purchase decisions. The first is cognitive. In cognitive, boy, we don't like to do it. It's hard. We have to spend a lot of time, effort, and money. Sometimes to do so, we look at 100 different reviews on Amazon, specifications of the product, and half the time we just shut down because it's too much work. Responsive is the second level of purchase decision. That's when we are doing something in response to something that we've seen or heard or read. And that's the main role of branding and marketing is to get people to respond to our messages. And then finally, there's reflexive. Reflexive is when we buy things without even thinking. We know the brand. We trust the brand. And that's what we ultimately aspire to do with all of our marketing efforts is try to get people to a reflexive state because when they're reflexive, they trust us, they know us, and they'll just buy us. Branding is really simple. Our job is to figure out how our products and services fit into the lives of our customers in a way that will make their life better and then telling them that message in every marketing execution that we undertake. Every marketing activity, every consumer touch point needs to be singing the same song, whether it's public relations or our advertising or our social networks or our digital marketing or live events or pricing and website. Everything has to be singing from the same hymnal. Branding begins with consumer marketplace insights. We have to understand our competitors. We have to understand our consumers. We have to do both qualitative and quantitative research, which we'll talk about later in the, in the research chapter. But branding is about beating up your competition, but it's by outbraining them, not out muscling them with price promotions. Branding is about differentiating your product and service from the competitors. If I ask you to take a look at the Rice Krispies box and said, what does it taste like? You'd all know exactly what it tastes like. If I ask you who the characters were, you'd all go, ah, oh, snap, crackle, and pop. If I ask you to take a bite of Rice Krispies in your mind, you know exactly what that mouthfeel would feel like and what the crisp and the crunch would be. Same with Cheerios. But what about Weetabix? Have you ever heard of Weetabix or Scott's porridge oats? Well, here's a little piece of insight. If a customer doesn't know what it is you're selling, there's a 100% guarantee they won't buy anything from you, which is the whole point of why we do branding and marketing, to let people know what we're selling. Branding is about creating strong messages that mean something to the customer. It's about defining a target audience and understanding not just them from a demographic standpoint, but what else is going on in their lives so that we can, we can might leverage some of those things that they're doing. Looking at a teenage boy, What's he drinking? What's he eating? What kind of things is he doing? He's playing a lot of video games. He doesn't go to watch television much. He likes cool clothes. Now, if we understand those things, we get a deeper understanding of, of who he is and how our product might fit in his life in a way that can make his life better. Branding is about being strategically creative. How do you make your product different, better, and special in the mind of the customer? Branding comes to life with the creation of a brand positioning strategy. The brand positioning comes from a lot of different sources. You have to look at your competitors, your place in the market. Who's the biggest? Who's the cheapest? Who's the fastest? Where are your skills? Are there gaps there that are not being fulfilled? Then how does the customer feel about your product? That all leads to what we call a three-circle analysis, where in circle one, we put our customers and what do they need. Circle two, our business or our brand or our service. And what do we offer the customer? 
And then in the third circle is our competitors, seeking to find that point of difference for your company, which we call the winning zone. That becomes the benefit in the brand positioning statement. And also identifying the losing zone, which is where we'd get our heads crushed if we tried to compete there. So we just stay away and let the competitors take that niche. Brand positioning statements have three core parts. The first is a target audience. Who is it we're targeting? Second is the benefit statement. What is it that we're offering the customer? And third, how do we do it? This is the world's greatest product. Scrubbing bubbles. Wow. They have taken cleaning your toilet and made it fun. How did they do that? Well, it starts with strategy. Their brand positioning statement targets homemakers with the benefit of Dow bathroom products or the easy way to clean your tub, tile, and toilet. And that, the reason why is that's because only Dow bathroom products contain scrubbing bubbles that cut through the dirt and the grime clean to the shine. That's the strategy that the brand team gave to the agency. And then they took it and created the little scrubbing bubble guy. And then they execute that perfectly on every single thing that they do across all their packages, their websites, their advertising. Everything leverages the scrubbing bubble guy as their key point of difference. Now let's talk about marketing. Digital marketing covers a broad spectrum of things. It's basically anything that can happen online from social networks to display advertising to search uh, engine optimization, content marketing, emails, you name it. Anything that happens in the digital online space is underneath this umbrella that we call digital marketing. Traditional marketing is still relevant. We can't just walk away from key elements that have been used for decades to talk to customers. It's not about traditional versus digital. It's about creating a marketing mix using both traditional and digital tools. Now, when we look at all the different things available to us through uh, social commerce, events, sales, offline advertising, online advertising, marketing has gotten a lot more difficult in the past several years due to the advent of digital marketing. So, if you want to fail, here's a few things that you can do. Number one, assume they're interested. They're not. Almost every app built for a brand on Facebook has practically no use. It's heavy, immersive experiences, and that's not how people engage and interact with brands. 0.5% of people talk about brands on Facebook. Why? Because Facebook is not an advertising medium. Facebook is a place where we go for entertainment to engage with our friends and our family. Of 200 brands studied, only one had a level of engagement over 2%. Most people don't know much about the brands they buy. You probably have Heinz Ketchup. Where's it made? What's in it? You probably have no idea, and that's just fine. 50% of all knowledge about brands is held by just 20% of its buyers. 80% of buy brand buyers know little or nothing about the brand. Because learning about brands isn't that important. Learning what they do for us is what it's all about. If you want to fail, assume they're yours. 72% of Pepsi drinkers also drink Coca-Cola. Duplication of purchase is unavoidable, but it's also predictable. Take a look at this study of toothpaste buyers who, at the top, claimed which brand was their favorite brand. Then they were studied over 12 months to see what they bought. Well, 49% of the buyers in the study claimed that Colgate was their favorite brand, yet 46% of them at some point over the year bought an Aquafresh, 35% bought a McLean's, and 18% bought a Sensodyne. How does that happen? Why would I say it's my favorite brand and then go buy something else? Well, the answer is pretty simple sales. We walk into the store thinking that we're going to buy our favorite brand, but if we walk in and the Colgate is $4.99 and the Aquafesh is on sale for $0.99, cents, we just reach over and grab it and off we go. The fantasy, the fantasy is that your brand and your customer, they're in love. But the reality, the reality is your customers are just somebody else's who occasionally buy you. Marketing is about conquest and conversion. If you want to fail, ask for their devotion. This is Fructis, the shampoo. The average person goes through eight or nine bottles of shampoo a year. Yet look at how many customers botch Fructis eight or nine times. Virtually nobody. Well, you could say this, maybe this is just an anomaly of that brand. No, if you take Pantene, the, the market leader in the shampoo category, has the same profile. The people who are 100% loyal are very few and far between. We love people to tattoo our logos on their rear ends, but... They're a very small minority, and they, we aren't going to make our sales 
by just focusing on them. Nescafe has seven times the market share of Maxwell House, yet their purchases per buyer are virtually identical. It's just that Nescafe has more people buying their product. So what does love have to do with it? There are two different ways you can go about marketing. You can go after your current customers, which we would call loyalty campaign, or you can go after new customers, which we'd call penetration campaigns. As you can see, sales, market share, profit are all far more viable and more profitable if you go after new customers. We spend 95% of our time, effort, and money trying to find new customers. Our loyal customers, especially if they're in a reflexive purchase environment, they're going to buy us no matter what. They, they love us. They trust us. But new buyers, well, we have great opportunities to, to, with them. Your brand's health depends on lots of people who don't know you well, don't think of you much, and don't buy you at all, if at all. If you want to fail, expect them to work at it. Number one reason why people say they interact with companies on social sites is to get a discount. That's it. They just want a discount. Human relationships demand massive processing power. In the most complex product category on earth, wine, where you've got different types of grapes and different wineries and different years that all have great impacts on the, the product, the average purchase decision is made in under a minute. If you go to the grocery store and you walk down the cereal aisle, which has more products than any other category in the store, the average purchase is made in 23 seconds. You don't walk down the aisle and go, oh, look, Rice Krispies has got a new thing. Where's the Lucky Charms? Oh, they're magically delicious. Oh, look, more flavors of Cheerios. Woohoo! You don't do that. You just walk in, you, you grab what you're looking for, and off you go, which means that you were in a reflexive purchase state. You knew what you were going after. You just walked down the aisle, spotted it, and grabbed it, and off you went. Heuristic. Heuristic is, means mental shortcuts that ease the cognitive load of making a purchase decision. And that's what we ultimately try to get to so we can get reflexive purchase. Our package shape, our colors, our logos, all of those things help ease the cognitive load. So if I'm looking for Tide, I go in and I look for the orange bottle. If I'm looking for Coke, I go in and I look for the red. And that's the whole point of branding, to try to help people make their purchase decisions so that they'll grab our brands and products. If you want to fail, assume that you complete them. 77% of people say they don't have relationships with the brands. You know, a lot of people say we need to build brand relationships. No, we don't. We need to build trust with, their, with our customers. Brand relationships are nothing like human relationships because much of what we make isn't vital to their lives, but trivial. If we woke up tomorrow morning and the headlines say Coca-Cola is dead, well, some of us might be a little sad. I don't think anybody's going to hold a funeral. There won't be marches on Washington to try to overturn the decision. You'll just go out, buy a couple of cases, hoard them for a little bit, take a, have a Coke when it's a special occasion and when it's done and you've drank your last can, you'll, you'll toast and go buy a Pepsi or a Dr. Pepper. Much of what we make isn't vital, but incidental. Incidental to playing with our kids, sharing a moment on a park bench, walking our dog in the rain. Ordinary, awful, awesome, everyday life. Our challenge isn't that people aren't paying attention. They are. Our task is not nurturing enthusiasm. It's overcoming indifference. Indifference is the strongest force in the universe. It makes everything meaningless. Love and hate don't stand a chance against it. We have to overcome indifference because when somebody just shrugs their shoulders and says, eh, the game's over. So that's a quick overview of what this class is going to be about. It's going to be a wild ride, and I look forward to taking you on this journey. I'll see you soon.